Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Now, in the wake of the Grenfell Tower tragedy, there's a new focus on the state of housing in towns and cities across the country, driven by a deep sense of anger among a group of people who feel that their complaints have gone ignored by Westminster for too long. Well, earlier this week, I went with the Labour MP David Lammy to one of the most notorious estates in London to ask what needs to change. Broadwater Farm in North London home of Mark Duggan, whose death sparked riots across the capital in 2011. In the 1980s, this estate was engulfed in flames and violence that saw a policeman murdered. For many, the farm is still a potent symbol of London's segregated communities. There's a distrust of authority, and now the housing divide has been brought into painful relief by the Grenfell Tower tragedy. So how long have you lived on the estate? About, about, about 28 to 30 years. And what do you make of the housing here? It's rubbish. It's rubbish. It's crammed tight. Can't get anything done. There's windows that won't close. Back garden door won't lock. And do you think lots of people are angry? Yeah. Of course they are. Hundreds and hundreds of people are angry. I'm surprised there's not another riot. The people living here have seen the images of Grenfell Tower burning and heard the stories of those trapped inside. Now they're worried about their own homes. Michael Fleming is a builder who lives on the estate. My house is a virus. If I took you up there and opened the front door, you'd see it's a virus. And why is your house a virus then? Because we've got no storage. Everything is in the passage. Anything we've got to store has to be in the passage. Our bikes or anything, our boxes, my toolboxes, because there's nowhere else in the house. We haven't one cupboard in the house, apart from kitchen cupboards. Are people scared after seeing what happened at Yeah, Grenfell? I think they are. I think they are. The chair of the Residents' Association says that after years of raising concerns, the authorities are still not listening. Do you think that um, there's been a failure to listen to people living on housing estates? Oh, yes. Uh, there's sort of a, not only there's a failure, there's always a sort of a top-down sort of a, a policy, sort of a, a dictat, if you like, which says that this, this is the way it's going to be happening and totally lack, total lack of consultation. The engagement that they talk about is perfunctory. The trust of politicians here is low. They're all the same as the familiar refrain. David Lammy, the MP for Tottenham, who spent his childhood playing in Broadwater Farm, is one of the few trusted politicians. Um, all right, bruv. You spent a lot of time in here. I this is quoted in the house. Yeah, number here. 28, I think my cousins lived at, uh, just, just up there on the top. Um, and. Um, I very much live between their house and my house, which was just sort of parallel to this road down here. Uh, and we grew up together. Do you think that things have got better for the communities that lived on this estates when you were growing up? No, I don't. I, actually, I'm afraid I don't think things have got better. Because what there was in the 1970s, particularly, was full employment. You could get a job. Um, that was quite well paid and you could survive. David Lammy says he understands London's housing divide more than most. He lost a friend at Grenfell Tower and is furious about the conditions many in the capital have to endure. Fire doors that aren't fixed. Which must be a concern um, after well, There's a Grenfell. big concern now. In many communities, mistrust of the political class runs deep. If there is any suspicion of a cover-up at Grenfell Tower, that will only get worse. So it's been a little over two weeks since the Grenfell Tower tragedy. You've been talking a lot to different communities living in similar tower blocks. How have they been reacting? My sense is that if you live in a tower block estate in Britain, in fact, if you live in an estate, there's a quite a lot of fear, particularly amongst the women, the mothers with children that I talk to. And that fear is linked to their they're now very questioning of the stay put advice, worried about how they would make their way out with their kids at two, three o'clock in the morning. Um, and they're untrusting of, if you like, the authority figures that they're reliant on to give them the best advice, the local authority, the housing management organization, even the fire safety. Um, 
and that's partly to do with the divide that's opened up in society. The folk that turn up to give you that advice are not people who are living in a tower block um, or even know anyone living in a tower block, it would seem. So um, we're not in a great place. We're not in a great place in Britain. You are someone who isn't in that camp because you, of course, grew up around uh, this estate here. You lost a friend in the Grenfell Tower tragedy. You must still be grieving. I'm still in shock in a sense where we don't, you know, when you've, when a young woman is just beginning her life, you know, no one can really believe that she's not here. There's no way of making smoke in your lungs or burning uh, uh, presentable. It's, it's, it's horrific. You touched on this a bit earlier, but do you think people trust the authorities to get to the bottom of what went wrong and to try and put it right? I think the overwhelming sense from the victims is that this is a crime, um, that something went so badly wrong here that it amounts to gross negligence manslaughter. So people are hanging on that criminal investigation um, and want updates about how that's developing. We've heard that a lot of police are on the, you know, involved in the criminal investigation, which is good. We don't know whether documents have been seized. We don't know who's been spoken to, but that's the importance. And then in relation to the inquiry, the inquiry is about, yes, getting to the truth, but then also making recommendations um, so that it can never happen again. But that's years, years away. Um, and then as always, it's up to the government of the day to act on those recommendations and they'll be years off. By then the news agenda will have moved on, the scrutiny will have moved on. I won't have moved on and parliamentarians like me won't have moved on. So our job will be to hold to account to make sure that there is justice for those victims but that this never happens again. Talking about that inquiry, the judge himself has said that he's doubtful that it will be as wide ranging as some people hope. Are you worried about what happens with that inquiry? I'm disappointing that he's expressed doubt of that kind before even meeting the survivors and victims. This is not a court case. There's not two sides. There are survivors and victims, and it seems to me if you're leading an inquiry, you're walking with them to get to the truth and you need to be looking at the terms of reference and the scope of your inquiry in partnership with those people. So I'm worried that he's kicked off the inquiry, um, framing it in a sort of small, tiny way. And do you think he's the right person to lead the inquiry? Look, politicians have to always be careful of um, being in a critical place in relation to the judiciary. Uh, but he is a white upper middle class man who I suspect has never ever visited a tower block housing estate and certainly hasn't slept a night on the 20th floor of one. I hope he will do that in the days ahead. The job is not just to be independent and judicious. I'm sure he's eminently legally qualified. Uh, of course he is. It is also to be empathetic and to walk with these people on this journey. Um, uh, and to sit with them and understand that their lives were in the hands of the state and something badly, badly failed. It's a shame that we couldn't find a woman to lead the inquiry or indeed an ethnic minority to lead the inquiry in 2017. Um, and I think the victims will also say to themselves, when push comes to shove, there are some powerful people here, contractors, subcontractors, local authorities, governments, um, and they look like this judge whose side will he be on? So he needs to get close to those victims and survivors very, very quickly and establish that he is after the truth and he's fearless and independent and he won't be swayed because he too is a part of the establishment. Talking about walking with victims, what do you make of the political response on both the council level but also the national government level? Have politicians done enough to walk with the victims? Well, to lose everything, so, sometimes the lives of other family members, but literally everything you own to go up in flames is devastating for any human soul. But then to find that you're not cradled and supported after that, I'm afraid is a shocking indictment of our country. 
Um, and so um, I have to say that we have failed as a nation. And I, I'm not going to make that party political. We failed to support those people. Um, and I'm now going to get emotional again, but that makes me um, very upset, very upset that we, that we did that in those early days. And still today, something has badly, badly got gone wrong in that local authority who represents those people, but the gap between the people it represents is huge. Now, some have said that you have suggested that there's been a cover-up on the number of people who've died in the Grenfell Tower, a disaster. What you said was that what people say is that if you put the numbers out early, there could be civil unrest. Were you really saying that the number of people dead could have been covered up to prevent riots? The police have filled in a little bit of the information. We now know there are 23 homes. They don't know how many people were in them and they don't actually know who owned the home, leased the home, ran the home. Um, so we know a little bit more, but we still don't have a list of survivors. We're not able to subtract the amount of survivors from the approximate number of people in the building. Um, we know that 80 people have lost their lives. But the view amongst the victims, I spoke to them yesterday, is that many more lost their lives. Um, and you have to get close to these people to understand the degree of trust and how badly they have been let down. Um, and therefore, um, I believe the way to deal with that is constant communication. The com communication has been poor. It's got a little bit better in the last day or two, but it's been poor hitherto to this point. John McDonnell, the Shadow Chancellor, said that the victims were murdered. Were they murdered? No, I think that's not the right language. Um, um, for me, the right language is this amounts, it seems to me, to corporate manslaughter or gross negligence manslaughter. Jeremy Corbyn has also said that what happened at Grenville exposed the disastrous effects of austerity. Was that right, bearing in mind that a lot of this cladding was put up under a Labour government? The way I talk about it is a tale of two cities. Austerity, and here in London, you see it writ large, but you see it in other major cities across the country. You see at one end of the spectrum, social housing, um, a lack of quality and indifference to people's needs and concerns. And at the other end of London, huge gentrification, huge cranes, huge buildings, huge resource. And you absolutely see that in the London borough of Kensington and Chelsea. So yes, it is a tale of austerity, uh, but it's also a tale of massive, massive growth. And, and they are sitting um, deeply divided, it seems to me, in Britain at this point in time. We're doing this interview from the Broadwater estate in Tottenham. For many people, it's a symbol uh, of those divisions that you were talking about. Do you think that what happened at Grenville has perhaps exposed and brought to light at some of those splits between communities that were here in London already and also in other parts of the country? I think at the back end of the election, and one of the reasons why the Labour Party confounded expectations and did a lot better under Jeremy Corbyn than people expected, was that actually the public were up for a discussion uh, about public services, about the limits of the welfare state, what we've stripped back. And I think Glenfield then happened and brings that right to the public fore. It's really got into the heart of the Britain that I know, a Britain that likes to see itself as fair, as tolerant, um, um, and, and therefore is uncomfortable. Um, with with part of the face it's seeing back in the mirror of itself. Have people in these communities been listened to before? They've not been listened to. They've not been listened to for years. Um, and that, I'm afraid that's not just about the last seven years of austerity. That goes beyond party politics. Hearing what they're saying about the quality of their homes, hearing what they're saying about the kind of support they need, hearing what they're saying about the cap on their earnings in relation to their, the jobs and their expectations. We've got very, very poor at that. So poor that when people are desperate, as they are in the case of Glenfill, the way they've been treated, it's horrendous. Labour MP for Tottenham, David Lammy there.